First of all, provided me with a, a wonderful contact with a, almost all the top African historians. Many of them I have never met. Uh, also, non Africans who are Africanists, uh, people like Professor uh, Heibeck from Czechoslovakia, whom I regarded as a working encyclopedia on African history. But I met uh, Professor Vancina, who was working in the same field as myself, but I never met him. I'd read his book on oral tradition, but but I was to work with him for 20 years. Uh, I met Professor, uh, the, the French professor, Professor Devis from Paris University. Again, very well versed in African history. Now, this was a good experience. But secondly, sources. Uh, before that, I was most of us were restricted to English sources of African history. And suddenly I was exposed to French sources, Spanish sources, German sources, Indian sources, and a lot of sources in African languages. That to me was a very, very good experience. Sadly, our first generation of historians, were, most of us were fairly old, but this project exposed me to the younger t group who are coming up. And, uh, many of them were very critical of uh, what we were doing and what we had written. And we used to meet them whenever we went around uh, the continent. We'd organize uh, discussions, lectures, and so on. And it was very useful to meet the, our future successors, many of them very critical of what we were doing. Thirdly, fourthly, uh, we had a lot of special problems on African history, and we used to organize special uh, meetings for those special uh, problems. One of them was the history of ancient Egypt very controversial. So we brought in all the experts on that and we sit back and listen. And after 20 years of that kind of thing, uh, and particularly our meetings uh, at the International Committee was like advanced uh, study seminar. We used to have rigorous discussion sometimes even uh, disagreeing violently, so that what we had collected will be discussed in a kind of seminar sometime for the whole week. So that is the experience I had, and by the end of it, I really felt that now I was an expert on African history, thanks to the project. The project was important for me for several reasons. If you look at uh, what we used to call African history, most of the voices were external voices. The books are read in school, the books are read at Macaire. The books I was used, I started using as a lecturer, were all written by foreigners. They are, the people were telling us who we were and what we were. Many of them came to the conclusion, actually, that there was no African history. When I started teaching uh, history at Makere in 1959, I had to compile my own books, in fact, notes, cycle uh, style them, and distribute them to my students. Because there were no books. There were no books. And this problem of the external factor in African history was very important. It was not really African history. And many of us were not doing very much about it. But at least this project helped us 
If you read Van Cleaner's uh, autobiography, Living with Africa, and he was one of the most active members of this group, he has uh, written, and I quote, that Africa is probably the only continent where the inhabitants are not in charge of their own history. The concepts and paradigms we use are borrowed, and in many cases, the training we give, the courses we teach, and the book we use are foreign oriented. And it suggested uh, that in our study of African history, we should ask ourselves two questions. Whose history are we writing? And for who? I personally, I would add one more question. Which Africa are we living in? He said he was living in Africa. At which Africa? It may be the intellectual Africa he was living in. So, I think Bantina had a point. We are not in charge of our history. And uh, I would say this uh, project, after more than uh, about 20 years, we really felt that at long last we were now in charge of our history. We felt so. Now I'm not sure, but <laughs> during that time, we, we really felt we, we knew what we were talking about and we were in charge. After being uh, strangers in our own uh, world for a long time, so I would say that is uh, the importance I would try to. But I should say, ask uh, whether it's still relevant. I, I would say it's relevant, and the problem is now more complicated uh, for our historians, and uh, I'm in touch with a number of them. Uh, because now uh, we have this problem of globalization. And uh, I think uh, new historians will have to confront uh, this problem. Uh, and the globalization is virtually excluding the African intellectuals from what I would call intellectual tribunal. The globalization of vocabulary is really uh, minimizing African history. And in any case, the African voice is disappearing very rapidly in that uh, international tribunal. And the situation in is rather complicated now by, by several factors. There's a, a big upside of international migration. You see them every day, people trying to go here and there, and they are, they are being kicked around. There's international or inter-ethnic tension everywhere in the world. There are uh, clashes of cultures and similarities. There is uh, fundamentalism and terrorism. And there is, uh, I would say, uh, all these problems are now complicating the work of uh, any African historian. But despite all this, I still think the African historian can use the general history of Africa as a base from which to uh, define a new public space. That background, I, I occasionally I look at them, I think it's still relevant. But there is a new problem, which we didn't really confront in our text, but they are getting worse. And somehow or other, this thing must be, the new historian must look at this and see how they can accommodate or help us to understand what is going today. I, I, I think uh, some of the changes I would make in the is in the composition of the uh, the writers or the directors. Uh, we had a lot of people who were there for different reasons. For instance, we had uh, Professor Sage uh, from Britain. 
At that time, he was also one of the chief editors of Cambridge History of Africa, which was regarded as a rival project. He never appeared, he never attended anything, but the name was there, it was kept for 20 years. We didn't, couldn't understand why he was there. Secondly, we had Professor Franco from Cuba. He never attended, very knowledgeable, but he never attended because he was too old. He was almost 90 like me. He never attended. So I think he was there for public relations. Then we had the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobacco, Dr. William. Too busy, that Prime Minister. <laughs> Nobody really expected him to be traveling all over the world, uh, writing African history. So he must have been put there for public relations. If I were to do this, I would exclude him and uh, ask them to wait for our product. Even with African uh, members, uh, many of them were not historians. Many of them never contributed anything, but they were there. And we kept asking ourselves, <laughs> why were they there? So, that is, I think I would make a radical change there. But also, uh, if I were to do it, I would mix the older historians with the younger one. Yeah, because you need both. But, uh, I think most of us were almost people were retired. Uh, and uh, we only met the younger ones when we were recruiting the contributors and so on. But I think a mixture would have really helped uh, the, the project. Uh, as far as update is concerned, I, I think there are three areas that we failed really to do much about. One of them is the Nile Valley. We struggled, we had two seminars, one in Cairo, one in Aswan. Aswan annoyed us most of us because most of the evidence had been drowned in Lake Nassau, <laughs> despite attempt by UNESCO to rescue them. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that Nile Valley history. Even ancient uh, Egypt, I've just written a book on it myself, which is annoying a lot of people. But even uh, a script like a meritic script has not been deciphered. I think we are waiting for another Frenchman to do it for us. <laughs> so that is one whole area where uh, we need a lot of work. The whole Indian Ocean, we even pleaded with UNESCO after We've gone around the Indian Ocean that most of us really knew nothing. Concentration has been on the Atlantic, but Indian Ocean, and a lot of things were happening in the Indian Ocean side, up to China. But we went to Madagascar, we went to Mauritius, all this. <laughs> what we could find is ignorance all around. So if we are going to update that, something must be done about the Indian Ocean. There's a sea of ignorance there. And uh, even uh, the, the Horn of Africa here, we are now having a problem between Kenya and Somalia about boundaries. But we are very ignorant about the history of the Horn here. Uh, we know a lot about Ethiopia. We know a lot now about Kenya and so on, but the Horn as a whole and how people relate there, we know very little about it. So those are the areas, personally, I think, would need updating if we were to, to do it today.